Hello, friends. It's Lisa Howdy. Williams here. Hi, Rourke. How are you? Doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited for our next guest. Um, thank you, audience, for tuning in. We have been having so much fun hearing from our experts who have made this transition from corporate to entrepreneur, and they've been sharing their journey and ultimately the passion and joy that they've found through that process. Now, we're actually taking a pivot with Mr. Rourke Denver. Uh, Rourke actually comes from the military. Um, he was 13 years as a Navy SEAL commander and has gone on to be a best-selling author. Um, he is, with his company Ever Onward, he's actually helping leaders you know, move through their pain to move on to be able to just be unstoppable and perform at their highest level. So welcome to our interview series, Rourke. Thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So now your version of corporate was obviously the military, yeah. but I think, you know, really the same principles apply, certainly. Um, and certainly transition from the military is a very unique um, concept that a lot of people face. I would just love to find out, you know, about that move for yourself, you know, share what you learned that armed you to be this entrepreneur and business builder that might help some of our audience. Sure. You know, I, I come from a unique subset uh, or, or kind of um, uh, organization within the military as far as special operations command. So um, I was in the SEAL teams, which is, is the, the Navy's um, version of kind of special forces. And consequently, the creativity, um, the kind of entrepreneurial spirit lives in that organization, I think, more than a lot of others. There's plenty of, of, of big forces within the military that are very much um, paint by numbers, very regimented, very disciplined. And I, I say that with utmost respect. I don't say that um, in any way to belittle it. They just have a size component and a complexity component to the way they do things, um, that they are very, you know, bureaucratic, organizationally run. Um, so some of those spots for creativity tend to get squashed in those. Not the case in the, in the SEAL teams and special operations. So I, I was blessed to be in a military regimented structure, but one that, that valued, um, you know, creativity and wild ideas and, and the ways to look at the battlefield in a new way. Um, so I think that in some ways was a precursor to when I left, um, I had very little desire to go into, um, you know, a big class structure, organized uh, system business um, industry. I really wanted to work for myself and go, you know, eat what I killed and, and, and went and did it, did it on my own. So I think, I think that was a natural transition. Um, I got lucky in the sense that um, my entire time in the SEAL teams was basically chasing bad guys and prosecuting the war on terror in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and Africa. And so the things I wanted to do, the rocks I wanted to turn over, um, I got to turn over. So I didn't, I didn't feel like there was a, uh, an itch that needed to be scratched. So when I left, I was ready to leave. It was time um, for new challenges to be around, um, you know, be around my family uh, and, and just really get new adventures. So I had a smooth transition. There's also some opportunities that had just kind of naturally grown out of my time. Um, very early on, this was before very few books had been written about um, special operations, SEALs, special forces, and all those elite units. And so I was early into that and, you know, got into a book that ended up being a bestseller. And that, that didn't do me any harm as far as um, kicking off uh, some of the speaking and the consulting. You know, a lot of authors or writers will do what they need to do to sell the book. As soon as they're done selling books, they don't want to talk anymore. And I, I kind of got to the, <clears throat> excuse me, I kind of got to the end of, of the speaking to promote the book. And, and I had a team there in Los Angeles that was booking me for speaking. I was like, you know, you're knocking these out of the park. I mean, a lot of the feedback we're getting, they really enjoy it. You know, there's a real business here and obviously a real need desire um, from leaders and entrepreneurs and organizations and high performance teams um, to get guidance from folks with your background. And so I just naturally flowed into that. So I got very, very lucky in my transition and, and by no means um, do many people leave the military uh, with, I would say, as gilded a path um, to find something they want to do. I think they've got all the skills to do it. They're just not as easy a transition. But for me, I I got lucky. I got very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that the military and corporate really does arm us with tools to create a business and, and yeah. truly, you know, create something for ourselves. I do think there's a disconnect for some reason for people though. They seem to think, you know, they, they 
they struggle with applying, applying that same work ethic of working for someone else to building something for themselves. You know, what can you tell us about that, that work ethic and sure. what, you know, what's necessary to be successful? Well, I'll, I'll tweak your, you know, your question or kind of, <laughs> no, that's all right. um, and my kind of response to it in that I, I've mentored a bunch of, of young lions kind of coming out of the military, former teammates and folks that, that, you know, might even come from an organization. They connect me through whether it be social media or an organization. Um, one of the things I see, and I would imagine this, this runs um, parallel or similar to kind of the corporate space is a lot of people will leave their existing job, their existing position. And when they go to transition, you know, if they're not going to the exactly the, the same job or the exact same path, um, I think they sometimes undervalue or don't look um, at the right things that they bring from that last job. Like now, now the most intense version of that is, let's say I have, you know, a sniper or, or, or a guy whose job is, is to shoot weapons at long range. I mean, obviously, leaving the military to go into the civilian workforce or go into the civilian space, you know, unless he goes to the FBI or a SWAT team, there's not a one-for-one -one exchange of those skill sets. And sometimes they really wrestle with that. They're like, you know, what I did in the military doesn't translate to the real world. And I always say, you're looking at it the wrong way. Yes, probably being a sniper does not translate to working at Google. That being said, the things that you have are so much more intangible and so much more concrete than that in the sense that, you know, you understand rank structure, you understand discipline and focus and timelines and leadership and followership, not knowing how to punch a clock. You will work until the job is done regardless of what you're getting paid because that's the purpose we brought to the last job. There's not an organization on earth that's not looking for that. And if you start an organization, if you're going to go do the yourself, you know the framework of what to look for and how to apply that discipline and, and, and regiment to it. So um, I think from the corporate space, you need to do the same thing. You need to look at, yes, I might have this subset or very specific set of skills to bring to the next um, the next ridgeline or the next part of my life. And particularly in the entrepreneurial space, you better go way beyond just the, I, you know, was a bean counter at this spot. Now you're going to be in a leadership state. You're going to be in a follower seat. You're going to be, you're going to be HR, everything until all that gets established and built. And so I think you need to really look for those other things that kind of guided your path, hopefully to success. And I don't know a lot of failures in some spot that are like, oh, I'm going to go be an entrepreneur. It's generally people that have met with a level of success and frankly want more and want to do it on their yeah. own. And so if you take those, uh, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, we're, for those people that are watching this later, we're in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. And a lot of people are living in a place of fear right now. Now, you literally have been in situations where you truly are fearing for perhaps your life and certainly the life of those that you're leading. What can you share with people about, you know, that are stuck in that fear place right now to mobilize them to propel forward? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, some of the greatest lines that have ever been written is, you know, the only thing to fear is fear itself. And, and there's so much you can delve into in the psychology of fear and how it becomes paralyzing and holds people back. Um, it doesn't always give you then a path to how to, um, you know, overcome it. My, my sense is... Um, I talk a lot about in my consulting practice when I talk to leaders and when I talk to teams about the merits of suffering and the merits of doing hard things. Because when you do hard things, you inoculate yourself to hard things. I mean, if you've done it, then when it comes, either when you least expect it or when you're not planning for it, you've done the work to, to, um, um, to kind of prepare and know how to wade through those situations. I guess in the job that we did, we probably pushed that needle to the farthest threshold it can be and everything, you know, past that part of my life is a reduction in intensity. So, you know, I have a ten tendency when people see that, you know, I'm not sweating the small stuff, it's because probably everything after my last life is small stuff. So um, I try and bring that into my life. So I guess the, the lesson ends up being um, is don't avoid pain. Don't avoid the tough conversations, the tough um, efforts, the, the task that looks like it can't be achieved. Um, nobody ever jumped up and celebrated doing something easy. It's just not the way the human um, psyche, I think, is designed. It's when we do hard things and challenging things um, as much as it uh, is painful in the going through of it, the back end of it is far more rewarding. 
Um, and so that, that's what I'd say. I'd, I'd say really um, don't avoid the tough stuff. Do the tough stuff. So when the tough stuff comes, which you, none of us can avoid it. sooner or later, you're going to get hit sideways, knocked on your butt or, or, or even worse. And you're either the type of person that's prepared for it, prepared for it, done the work to know how to handle it, or you're not. If you're not, it's pretty hard to catch up uh, if you haven't. Yeah, yeah. Now you, um, you're a father, and a, a big reason I made my own transition was giving my kids that example that they they can reinvent themselves at any time. I think a lot of people haven't even necessarily chosen what they're doing. They've kind of fallen into it. Tell me about what example you're providing for your girls in what you're doing and you know what others can do for for their gener next generations too yeah i mean i think i think the i think the number one thing you do is you have to set the example right you have to live the things you believe in and make sure you're modeling them i mean i can't ask them to be disciplined and focused and work hard if i'm not disciplined focused and work hard so those are going to be things that naturally i'm going to you know ensure i'm honoring um as an exemplar for them as does my bride the same she's she's you know runs our household uh is involved in every part of our lives on top of running part of my business her own you know passions and and those are are pretty disciplined and focused and and driven um so you got to set the example first and then the other thing i'll offer to you know certainly my kiddos then you know anyone that's young is is to really just go out and try a lot of things i i think it's a rare individual that says you know my great grandfather was a boot maker my 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 grandfather was a boot maker my father other was a boot maker and I want to be a boot maker. I mean, I'm somewhat jealous of people like that to have some singular focus and some young people find it. I mean, some young people are like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a vet. I want to be a fireman. And that ends up being the path they go. They'd never want anything else. And that, that satisfies and gives them tremendous purpose. And I, I think that's a gift. I don't think most people, and even those people I would recommend, go do a bunch of other things. Take the tough jobs. Go, you know, be a waiter and, and a waitress. Go dig ditches. Go work landscaping for a summer. Get a job in the service industry where you really learn how to treat people or, or how you want to make sure people treat you. Um, to seek out that thing you want. I mean, there's always so much talk about people following their passion, and I'm, I'm for passion. I think it's very hard to find it without you know, really sinking your, your teeth into lots of things to find out where, where that, you know, passion can take you. And, and even if you do a bunch of things that fall utterly outside the lines of any place you want to end up being, you'll take great lessons from them and, and you'll have a greater appreciation for other people. I mean, I, I, I worked as a, I worked at a pizza joint for four years in high school. I waited tables for a year after college just because I was training over in, uh, I mean, it wasn't miserable. I was over in Hawaii, but getting ready for SEAL training. And, you know, you wait tables, you will forever teach, teach, treat someone that's waiting tables like an absolute superstar because you know how hard the job is and, and, and how to treat people. So um, that will be my recommendation is to do all those things to kind of find, find that path that takes you where you want to go. Yeah, one of our, um, one of our speakers earlier, he talked about corporate where he found a lot of no's. But in this, in this world of entrepreneurship and business building, it's so many yeses and, and it seems like you all have this really generous nature about you. What yep. can you share about maybe the surprise that you found about this community of business builders and you know, what others might experience if they, if they made that leap? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you said it. I, I've found entrepreneurial groups and I've worked with some of the big ones, you know, EO, which is one of the top, you know, entrepreneurial organizations in the world and, and some of their senior leadership and some of their big flagship events that that really are some of the, the most kind of connected entrepreneurs, I think, in the world. And, and they are, they're there to support each other. They often, you know, give each other the lessons, they give the kind of um, peer group support. And then I think, um, the creativity that usually runs through those lines um, tend to help each other a lot. I mean, I, I've got a good buddy that's a writer out in Hollywood. So he writes, you know, screenplays and things like that. I remember talking to him when I started writing um, my first book. I said, you know, I asked a couple questions. One, I was worried about sharing some of the things I wanted to write uh, in that somebody might take some of those for their own work. And then two, um, you know, how, how do you kind of defend against that? And how do you, you know, how do you protect some of that stuff? And he said, it's the worst thing you could possibly do. To be honest, somebody has probably had a story with somebody else and that person ran with the story and, 
and, and took it. He, he fi- found that that's much more the exception to the rule that generally when he shared his ideas and you get more heads, more eyes, more thoughts looking at it, it just grew. And then people gave you ideas that you never thought of and, and could take it in a completely new direction. And, and that most people were very giving about that. It wasn't like, hey, you know, um, I just gave you the idea and now it's mine or I should get some cut for the most part. I was like, man, if I can give you something that helps um, your path and your journey, people are willing to do that. And, and, and I think, you know, it's just very simple. 15 heads are better than one if you can organize it and kind of harness uh, the power of that. So I think that's a, that, that's a great part of entre- entrepreneurship and, and, and don't not tap into that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, every one of you have, you have a story and you give credit to the person that shared that wisdom with you, which again, I think um, for whatever reason, I think a lot of companies have lost that nature of creativity and sharing. And I just think it's fabulous that you're teaching leaders to take that suffering and, and go on to higher levels. Can you talk to us a little bit about that training that you do for leaders and and maybe, you know, who could benefit from your consulting services? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways to kind of tap into what I like to do. I mean, I'd say the base of the pyramid becomes kind of the big stage, you know, big events, either big leadership, um, you know, offsites or conventions, but corporate uh, America can find me as well, um, either at RourkeDenver.com, which is my website, or, or um, Creative Artist Agency out in um, Los Angeles has a speakers division that I speak for. And so anybody that's looking to get me for kind of a big stage event, your big sales meeting, your kickoff, your end of the year thing, that becomes a real bread and butter where I share a tremendous amount of, you know, entertaining stories that, that connect to very succinct lessons that you can take with you. Um, um, I release something called my commander's coffee every month. It's a video I release just once a month. I try not to beat up with pe- people with it. So if they, you know, people are asking for more and I might increase it a little bit, but if you go to RourkeDenver.com, you can sign up for my commander's coffee. And I, I just tell a story or a principle or some concept that's hit me, uh, you know, in the current environment, obviously the last two have kind of um, lent towards, you know, the current pandemic and leadership and crisis and, and running families during um, challenging times. Um, so that's another great way to engage. But uh, I also have, um, you know, and you can get me through the website, other curated events. I mean, we do campfire sessions with small groups where we sit around a campfire and um, I'll tell stories and we'll do question and answer and solve problems. And there's multi-day events that can be that can be booked to really push the needle to a, a much more intense place as well. Those are all great places to, you know, find me. And what I like to do is really take my time in the military and kind of distill the principles and lessons I learned that obviously come from a very, very intense, um, high consequence world and transition that to leaders that that might not have the same level of consequence, but probably are every bit as passionate about what they're doing. And I've found that, you know, every once in a while, someone say, oh, well, what you were doing in the military was so intense. It's nothing like what I'm doing with. And I'm like, well, the consequences might be different, but the leadership principles remain the same. The teamwork principles remain the same. The organizational performance and high culture remains the same. If you have those, I don't care if you're making Lincoln logs or going to war in Afghanistan, the principles will work in both. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of people right now that are not sleeping at night because they're worried, but there's a lot of people that are excited right now about what innovation is going to come out of this. I'm, I'm curious, you know, what you're excited about, what, what are you seeing um, in terms of just the overall speaker uh, circuit, what do you see maybe as happening in the future that can help others that might be thinking about a leap like that? Yeah, I mean, in this in the speaking space, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I think it'll be interesting to see when things kind of come back, if people are going to be very reticent to get a bunch of people in a room together and want to watch a big stage event, or they're going to be thirsting for it. I can, I can see either one, and, and I bet it won't be finite. I bet it will be some groups be like, I can't wait to get everybody back together. Let's go to Disneyland and get the time together. And then there'll probably be some groups that are a little more circumspect and take their time to want to book those. So we'll see. I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a split with that. Um, um, 
I think when it comes out of this, I mean, I think sometimes this becomes a, a nasty word. I still kind of believe in winners and losers. I know it's become un PC to think about um, that. I don't think we're doing ourselves a service with everybody getting a blue ribbon for participating as opposed to somebody that worked the hardest mostly and got a victory. And then those that didn't work as hard to not. Um, and there's every, you, you know, nuance in between. Um, but there's going to be phenomenal women, winners and losers that come out. of this. There's going to be people that revamp their business model. Um, I would hate to be in commercial real estate right now because I think there's probably a whole bunch of businesses that are all working for home and are going to come to the back end for this and be like why, why would we pay rent I mean we just did everything almost as effectively from home some of our um, personnel if not all of them are happier being around their families and the rhythm that they're they're having right now um, so I mean I think uh, you, you know look it, it, we're talking on a web platform those are exploding and the ability to communicate remotely those are those are going to be clear winners um, and things always change. And, and, you know, it's just some people are going to know how to make lemonade and some people are going to, you, you know, get a sour rind and not know what to do with themselves. I, I think it's going to be a, a, a lot of everything and there's always opportunity. So um, I'm a constant optimist. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as the world moves forward, we look at these changes and try and predict what's going to happen. It's always hard to predict. It seems pretty sound that some of the best thinkers on earth always tend to um, believe that you know, when automation replaces people, that that's just the end. And it seems like some new opportunity um, explodes and becomes greater for, for the good. I, I, I do think, um, not to talk international politics, but I, I do believe we're starting to see, um, you know, some of the international relationships we have. And if that drove a whole bunch of products that are now going to say built in the USA, I'd be pretty happy camper about that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we've shipped overseas. And I'm for international commerce and all those things. I'm not, a, I'm not an isolationist. But if all of a sudden companies are like, hey, we got a whole bunch of people that want to work right here and build things right here. Um, when something says made in the USA, I usually have a pretty good sense it's going to be made well and built to last and something I want to put my hands on. So if that spikes through the roof, it'd be phenomenal. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know um, one of the things that I've seen as a really um, important part of building a business is mentorship. I certainly know that the military is um, amazing at mentorship. What can you tell us about the role that that's played in your life. And I, I think there are some people that don't really have someone in their life like that, that they could seek counsel from. What can you say to those people about how to get that? One of my all time favorite topics, almost like you planted that question, but we didn't talk about it before. You know, just as I think the idea of mentorship and that type of learning uh, are some of the greatest relationships um, you should cultivate and build in your life. Uh, in the military, there's just a very natural progression of those that know how to do what you're training to do. And therefore, you're obviously going to pay attention to what they have to say because they know it. I mean, if you, you know, if you're wanting to become a master baker, you go work for, you know, the best French baker there is and figure out how they do it. And then that's how you, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. And then hopefully if you're creative enough, you come up with, with other twists that make it yours. Um, the military is very, very disciplined in um, senior leadership, senior enlisted, um, senior subject matter experts teaching the people below them. And then, then it, the, the path just keeps moving forward. I mean, there are a bunch of guys that prepared my team for war that frankly hadn't been, been to war based on history. No, there, there'd been a big gap since Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, some of these small incursions. So I had a bunch of guys that put me through my combat training that never been to combat. Well, then my team goes for almost a decade. Now we're approaching two decades of sustained combat. So when we came back to the training grounds, we were, we were very armed to change it, update it, you know, say, hey, here's the newest best practices and the way you want to do things. And that just moves the ball down the field and makes everyone better. Um, to the folks listening on this, um, I would highlight one, be a mentor yourself. You know, you've learned stuff in your life and whether that's down to a, a church youth group, a Boy Scout, Girl Scout troop, or, or you know, a, a youth sports team, make sure you're mentoring people, particularly young people. Um, but then there's almost no point in your life that cultivating kind of a council of, of mentors for yourself, that mentor you that you can tap into. Um, that, that's one of the real secrets. I mean, one of my mentors uh, is in his mid to late seventies, this guy has achieved everything I would basically want to achieve, both in family, in business, in finance, uh, in purpose-driven work. Um, and you would think he had it all 
he figured out and he has mentors and people that he taps into. And then, and, and I'm, you know, 40 some odd years younger than him. And he thinks of me as somebody that offers a bunch of new ideas and energy and concepts. So, you know, we're, we're working on projects together and it's just a delight to have those people in your life. So I'm, I'm real purposeful about having mentors that can help guide my journey and path and bounce ideas off. It's, um, I mean, that's gold. And if you're not tapping into it, you're missing a tremendous resource. Well, and I, I find, I feel like, People, all they need to do is ask. That's usually all it takes. That's <laughs> all it takes. I yeah. mean, humans, we want to help others. Yeah. Now, I, you and I chatted briefly about this, and I've had a lot of fun um, hearing about this from our speakers. I find a lot of you have a guiding power in your life. For some, it's faith. For some, it's just eternal hope. I'm curious about, you know, what, what role faith has, has played in your life. And, um, you know, also just for those that, that don't have that, what, what might they, you know, uncover and reveal in their life if they put some effort into exploring that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, I just did kind of a video post for a, a veteran service organization that I'm on the advisory board for. And they asked me to do a little video about kind of how I'm surviving and thriving, hopefully in this you know, current pandemic. And, and the thing that just struck me, I, I had some ideas then as, as the video kind of went hot, um, it just kind of jumped in my, my, my mind that there's, in my mind, there's this kind of holy trinity that you deal with in life. And that's mind, body, and spirit. And those three things are interconnected. And if you think you can neglect one or favor the other over the two, it's like a, a tripod or a stool. It will not stay in balance. And, and I don't think you, you know, you can't probably do it equally well, but you better be paying attention to all three. So the mind's easy. That's, you know, schooling, mentorship, reading, thinking, and learning. Um, the body's simple, you know, pick heavy things, put them up over your head, run until your heart rate or walk until your heart rate gets up, do that every day and try and eat well. So you've taken care of that. Very, very simple. And then when it comes to the spirit, I think um, I try and be very careful on, on the way I like talking about, um, you know, faith and the spirit. I mean, some, for some people it is organized religion. And I think that's, you know, one of the greatest foundations there are in this world as far as a set um, discipline focus of values and principles to adhere to and the way to treat people. Um, if that's not for you, if you don't want to find yourself uh, in a church on Sunday or reading a specific book every night, um, it can be as easy as meditation. It can be easy as breathing. It could be as easy as uh, just taking time out of the day to give thanks. That mentor I was talking about, um, he has an unbelievably disciplined morning um, morning routine. So he gets up and he writes for 10 minutes. He, um, he reads for 10 minutes and he basically prays for 10 minutes. These are his and, 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 um, and, and he's, I think one of the greats because of that morning routine, you know, he, he is one of those people that has set a disciplined task to start his day. And so, um, you know, if it's religion, great, that'll give you a good foundation. If it's meditation, I think you're going to get a tremendous value about that. If you did nothing else other than wake up in the morning and be thankful and give thanks for, you know, kind of what we all enjoy and what opportunity lies in front of you, um, I think it's going to create tremendous balance in your life. So it's important. It's important. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, gosh, we are almost out of time, friends. I have one more question. I've really been enjoying asking um, about your, your legacy, Rourke. Um, if you were not able to leave assets to your girls, but you could leave them with nuggets of wisdom or abilities, you know, advice, things like that, what would you leave them? You know, I, I think I'm far less interested in what I would, would leave my family. Um, I mean, I certainly do, wouldn't want to leave my family in a, in a lurch, but I, I'm very disinterested in the physical things or the, uh, the monetary gifts I would leave, um, you know, my kiddos. And, and uh, you know, my brother and I have even talked to our dad, who's been, you know, a very successful uh, trial attorney, thinker, and, and um, businessman. And I, 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 we kind of tell him all the time, we're like, look, spend whatever inheritance you're sp given to us, let's spend it now. Let's go fishing and hunting and take trips and spend time together. I'd, I'd much rather be purposeful of the time I have with, with him than anything that'd be given, you know, later in, in, in the, uh, the long experience. So I think it will be experience. I mean, the thing I want to do is go get adventures with my, my girls, my bride. And we take that very seriously. This is not a future desire. This is something we do right now. Um, the world's making it a little more challenging, but by no means can you not get creative and get out there. But a lot of overseas time I'm trying to do with my kiddos because I think, 
the gift of the world and seeing other cultures and kind of having a sense of, of this greater context of what the world offers and how differently people life, live their lives, look at their lives, value things uh, that we value or don't value uh, is a tremendous gift. And then just the constant pursuit of learning. You know, I want them to just to love learning and to pursue learning their entire lives. If they do that, I think they'll find a very, very rich life and not monetarily. I love that. Have you been to Alaska by chance? Oh yeah. Many times. Many times. I'm from, I'm from Alaska. Yeah. yeah. One of my best memories was my mom caught a 52 pound King salmon. Yeah. And it took like five hours for between my grandpa and my mom and my dad and I. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you've been brilliant, Rourke. I so appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, I could feel like I could talk to you forever. But um, to our audience, we so appreciate you tuning in uh, to our Corporate to Entrepreneur series where we've just been having so much fun hearing from these experts. Um, this is Lisa Williams with Perfect Side Gigs. Bless you in your life journey, and we will see you soon, friends.